how do we say it is well with our soul in the midst of all that we're going through? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So thank you, team, for leading us in worship this morning. Well, I don't know about you, but I had a really good week. The sunshine this week was great. Um, actually, you know, a lot of us working from home and doing, you know, work the non-traditional way. Because the weather was so nice, I had all these conference calls. I was outside, you know, cleaning out our garden beds and painting the shed while on a conference call. It was really good. Um, since I didn't have, at least I chose not to say anything during those conference calls, but... Um, as a result, though, my seasonal allergies kicked in, so just want to say that from front, I apologize if I sniffle quite a lot during this, so they are alive and kicking, so. I also want to welcome our newest members. Uh, I'm excited that you guys are part of our, our church. So you guys have been with us for over a year now, for some of you, um, if you guys have not had a chance to get to know uh, these three young men, I encourage you to do it. Um, I've had a chance to sit and talk with them. Ian, who grew up in Japan, was over here last year as a freshman, didn't know how to drive, didn't have a driver's license, and he asked me to teach him how to drive. So I took him out. So if you're in Cedarville and something happens, you can blame me. But... Uh, uh, yeah, but as a church, not only should we welcome them, but encourage them and, and, and encourage them to get involved with you and listen to them as well. So, so welcome. Uh, and last, before we get started, uh, I'm excited, as are all the rest of the Holloways, that Jacob and Sikora are up here. So welcome. Uh, they just moved up from Texas earlier this week, and so... Uh, not knowing what Jesse, what's going to happen with Jesse, but most of the clan is here. So, which, yeah, it's a good takeover. So, pray with me before we uh, dig into uh, James chapter 5. Father, we come before you this morning uh, thankful for who you are and what you have done. We come expecting to hear from you this morning as we open up your word, knowing that it is powerful, that it is able to, to cut through our earthly ways of thinking uh, and to shape us into the kind of men and women that you want us to be. Um, and so, God, I pray... Uh, that we will approach your word today uh, humbly and open and, and listening to your spirit. Uh, God, as I always pray, uh, Lord, I pray uh, that my words will be your words. Uh, that the things that I say would be of you and that things that... Uh, are not of you would be quickly forgotten. Uh, God, I know that you've been working on my heart this week as well. And so, um, yeah, so change me to be more like Jesus as well. And thank you for the truths that we are about to look at, that we do have hope, and we do have reason to say that it is well with our soul. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please open up to the book of James, and we're going to be looking at the fifth chapter today. Um, James, of course, is toward the back of your Bible, um, a small little letter after the book of Hebrews. Um, and as you have, if you've been around for a while, know that the title of our sermon series has been called Holding Fast, um, and it's really our, our way of talking about how can we navigate through all of life's challenges and difficulties? How do we navigate through the threats and the oppression or the injustices that we face? And how do we do it in such a way that we don't give up and don't kind of cross over to the dark side? 
And we've said from the very beginning that the key to holding and to holding fast is knowing the truth of God's goodness. And knowing the sufficiency that we have in Jesus Christ. So, and so we've said that holding fast looks like, well, it, it, what it does is it allows us to face adversity in a way that promote, promotes Christian maturity. It promotes God's glory. That holding fast to God's goodness turns hearers into doers. It leads us to kingdom-centered gatherings like we have here today. It produces generosity. And it helps us in the midst of some of life's hardest trials. But as we're going to look at today in the middle part of chapter 5, we're going to see that holding fast to God's goodness brings the future judgment to bear on the present. So again, I've said this before, but hopefully you've, you've taken us up on our invitation to follow along with us and to use our study guides with it um, and have been reading along as we go ahead. And, you know, we only have a couple more sermons on the book of James. Uh, next week, we're going to finish up the book. And then the following week, we're going to do sort of a, a wrap-up series. And I think all of the elders are going to be a part of that one. So... Um, you don't have much time to continue to read ahead and read along with this, but I still want to encourage you to do that. Um, and you can still grab a study guide in the back. Um, but you see where holding fast to God's goodness helps us um, toward all these things. And so please stand with me, and we're going to read these six verses that we're going to be studying today. So just follow along as I read. Starting in verse 7, it says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we considered blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else, let your yes be yes, and your no, no, or you will be condemned. Let me be seated. The first thing I want you to notice, just notice how he addresses his audience as he's writing to them there. Four times he says, brothers, or in some of our translations, brothers and sisters, which is probably a more accurate rendering, you know, it's not usual for us when we're talking to somebody to constantly repeat their name in conversation. Like, you know, hey, Greg, I want to let you know about how my week went this week. And Greg, can I tell you all about uh, what my kids did this week? And Greg, man, that's a great looking, like, we, we just don't often talk that way. Although some of us do pray that way and say Lord every time we start a new sentence, but that's a different conversation. But, um, but what this is here, and when he's saying brothers or brothers and sisters, as he's starting these, these different thoughts, is an earnest appeal to them to hold on to God's goodness. It's the earnest appeal to these people who are in the midst of a, a pretty uh, deep and strong oppression. So if you have your notes, you can uh, follow along with me. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a summary of what this passage is about. And you can fill in the blanks there that are in the notes. But James here, in these six verses, turns his attention from condemning rich oppressors, which was what last week's sermon was about in verses 1 through 6. So he turns his attention from condemning rich oppressors 
to encouraging believers who are being oppressed. He charges them to be patient and strong in the midst of their oppression in light of the Lord's soon return. He says that they shouldn't grumble or turn on each other. Rather, they should be encouraged and challenged by the examples of the prophets and Job who remained faithful to God despite great suffering. And then lastly, there in verse 12, he says that their speech should be marked with integrity. So that was my summary statement for uh, these six verses. And so let's just remember, let's put this in context. If you remember last week's sermon, the rich people that were part of their congregation were proudly and cruelly ruling over the poor. They were oppressing them. They were, they were not paying him wages. These were the same people, same rich people that had been invited into the church and given seats of honor while the poor or less deserving people were put in the back. These were the same people that they brought in because some people thought that these wealthy individuals would bring them jobs or bring them status or honor. But these were the people that were actually taking advantage of them. So in the face of opposition, in the face of oppression, in the face of being offended, what does James tell the believers to do? And what is James telling us to do in the midst of that? What, what solution is James offering for this problem that's going on in the church? Well, he doesn't tell them to join in and and become like them. He doesn't tell them to go on to strike, to go on strike or to man to demand their rights. He doesn't tell them to stand up for themselves and get the recognition that they deserve. Nor does he say that it's okay to despair on one hand, or does he say that you should have some, you know, amazing optimism on the other hand? He doesn't say bury your head in the sand and just forget that it's happening. Or he doesn't even say just deny that it is happening or deny that there's meaning and truth or anything else behind it. But what James does do here is he offers makes the suggestion, the command, the, the, the teaching that they should live through these four virtues. And so we're going to look at four vir virtues that are found here in these six verses. The first virtue that we'll find is that of patience. Patience. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I learned about patience as a little kid, second grade, from the music machine. Now, how many of you who are my generation or know of the music machine? My kids do. Not, not many people raise their hands. All right, so this was this. Matt, you don't know the music machine? Oh, it's kind of hard to describe. A little Christian play. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad you're with me talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and you put something in a machine, and a song comes out. And one of the songs from the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, long suffering, was patience. And the patience song that came out was, have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. You guys know that now? All right. If you get unpatient, you only start, I don't want to sing it, remember, yeah, I do want to sing it, remember that God is patient too, and think of all the times when others have to wait for you. All right, so it's about this sna uh, snail named Herbert who, anyway, I'm not going to go on. Patience. It is, it's one of the fruit of the spirits, but sometimes we think of patience as just 
inaction or slowing down. And it entails that, but it entails more than just merely waiting, more than just slowing down. The, the essence of patience is a willingness to endure suffering. Think of it this way. For those of you who have little kids or those of you who remember being little kids, um, this frequently happens in my own house, but two little kids in a room, and one is playing with some toys. You know, I usually have one who's playing with their, their Barbies or something, and the other one's either reading a book or watching a movie or something. And, and one of my kids will say, I'm so hungry. I got to eat. I'm going to die. Mom wins lunch. And the other kid who's just doing something else is just oblivious to the whole rest of the world. And of course, Emily will tell the kids, you know, you know lunch, you just had snacks just a few minutes ago. Lunch is not going to be for another hour, hour and a half. You're just going to have to be patient. Just go on and do what you're doing and be patient. Of course, they go back to what they're doing. But the one who's oblivious to the world, who wasn't hungry, wasn't saying anything at all, they're, they're waiting that hour and a half too. But that one who is dying and is so hungry and it just has to eat now, who's waiting for that hour, which one is really the patient one? Well, it's the child that was hungry, who is suffering the hunger pains there. While the other one, while well, still waiting wasn't suffering at all, wasn't necessarily being patient. I mean, it's part of it, right? The waiting is a part of it. But it's the willingness to suffer and not bug mom every 15 seconds that they need to know when lunch is. Well, even think of it in this terms, in terms of the, the, the noun patient, like when you are a patient at the doctor. You are somebody who is suffering an ailment. But patience, like I said, is not in action. In fact, it's sort of the median response to some unpleasant or undesired or unexpected situation. See, on one hand, you would have apathy, where you just don't care. You know, that, that might be the child who's sitting over reading or, or watching a movie or something and, and not really caring whether or not lunch is in an hour. One way of, of this would be sort of that mindset of, well, hey, que sera, sera. Or if you grew up in the 80s, that song, Gesera, you know, Gesera, Gesera, which... Anyway, um, the way I think sometimes really, does that confuse you? So, yeah, sorry. Um, there's always some 80s song stuck in my head. Just want to let you know, and lyrics pop out at the weirdest times. So, forgive me. Anyway, you know, this idea of, hey, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You know, that's, that's almost an apathy thing. It's, you know, this too will pass that leans toward the apathy part of it. That's not necessarily a trusting, an active trusting part of it. That's just a, eh, I'm not going to th overly think this. Apathy is sort of the doormat response. You just get walked all over, and the situation sometimes gets worse because of that. That's one extreme. When you're still waiting in the midst of that, but that's not really at the essence of patience. And the other extreme, there's anger or wrath. Where you're going to jump in and make things right. Where you're, you're going to respond. And maybe you might even be responding out of good motives. But this sometimes finds itself in, in attack mode. Where you find someone or something to blame. We just got to do something in order to get through it. And you know you're gonna it's going to take time to get through it, but you just want to be active in that. But patience is a, a virtue that lands right in the middle. 
It's not overlooking wrong, but it's also refusing to do wrong. Patience is the choice to overcome a wrong, not by taking the matter into your own hands, and or not to seek revenge on your own. I was talking to Emily about, you know, this idea of patience, and she recommended a book to me uh, by this woman named Karen Pryor, and it was called On Reading Well, and it's, it, it takes a bunch of classic literature and compares some of the characters in classic literature to, to the virtues that we want to see lived out in our own lives and in the lives of our kids. Um, and on this virtue of patience, it brought up the character of Anne Elliot in the book Persuasion, which uh, Jane Austen book. I actually read that for my wife as a Christmas gift one year. That was the best Christmas gift ever. It didn't cost me a thing. I just had to read a short book by Jane Austen. But anyway, in this book, uh, Karen Pryor says that patience is some, patience suffers virtuously. It's not a doormat or passively accepts the wickedness of wrongs. It's not succumbing to wrath toward others who are the direct cause of the wrong. Nor does patience allow pain to turn inward upon oneself, but patience... But patient bearing of suffering allows one to recognize the suffering of others. Now, have you ever noticed that some of the most generous and understanding and most patient people are those who have suffered or are in the midst of suffering? But patience is only a virtue when it's done with these right motives, too. Because there are other reasons we could wait patiently. You know, it could just be an indulgence or selfishness or a pride thing. But patience is that virtue if the cause for which that person suffers is good. St. Augustine said that patience is the virtue by which we tolerate <clears throat> evil things with an even mind. We tolerate evil things with an even mind. The patient person chooses to bear evil rather than to commit further evil in response to it. And that's really what was happening here with the church that, that James was writing to. These rich, wealthy oppressors were, were being oppressive toward the others in the church. And rather than responding with an evil to get back at them or to demand their rights or do whatever, Jim says, no, be patient. Don't respond like them. Augustine also says, patient keeps us from yielding to evils that are temporal and brief and from losing those good things which are great and eternal. Therefore, patience is the greatest of the virtues. So patience is the first thing that that James tells them to live out in the midst of their hardship. The second one is perseverance. And that's found there in verse 8. It says, you too, be patient and stand firm. I'm not going to spend as much time on this one, but stand firm. Some of your translations might say, strengthen your hearts. Or be strong in the inner man. But, but it's to be... It's a, in a sense, to set your face like flint, to be unmovable, but to, in a sense, unmovable and away from what you're supposed to be doing and continue on in what you are called to do. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, but, but the idea in the midst of hardship is that we are to stand firm and to persevere. 
one of my, my favorite Bible verses uh, is 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where Paul writes to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because there will be times when we'll feel like doing the right thing is not worth it. There'll be times when do, we, even when we're doing the right thing, we are going to face opposition, opposition. And people are not going to like it. And people are going to try and push us away from doing the right thing. Either actively or in ways that will distract us. But we are to persevere. We are to stand firm. We are to confirm that which God has called us to do. Luke 21, 19 says, Stand firm and you will win life. The third virtue that James talks about here is that of grace. In verse 9, it says, don't grumble against each other, brothers, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. So in the midst of, of hardship, or in the midst of opposition, in the midst of, of people coming at you, of injustice, we are to show grace. You know, to not retaliate, to avoid complaining, to avoid grumbling, to avoid finger pointing, to avoid blaming. And this, you know, it's something that's pretty typical. We're all aware of what comes when we are faced with trials and troubles that just keep coming on. You know, and that's what these abusive rich were doing to them in those first six verses. And grumbling could be directed in lots of different directions. You know, sometimes our grumbling is directed at God. How can you let this happen, God? Other times our grumbling, obviously, it's very easy to point it out to those who are doing the oppressing, those who are the cause of our, our pain and our suffering. But it's interesting in here that James says, don't grumble against each other. I can kind of imagine how this was being played out in the church at that time in light of what they were facing. Now, there, there, there might be conversations going on between a few people like, way to go, Matthias, or whatever person you want to throw in there. But, you know, if you hadn't invited that rich person into this church, we wouldn't be having this problem right now. Good job. Or... Can you believe Silas over there? <laughs> so stupid. If he doesn't put his foot down, that rich punk is going to come after me next. You know, sometimes we do this in our own families. You know, when we're powerless to handle a situation. When some wrong has happened to us. It's within, I don't know, something within us that it's almost just natural that we look for someone or something to blame. And so we might come home from a bad day at work and we might go on the offensive and take things out on our kids or take, take things out on our spouse or take things out on our roommates. We just come home grumpy and complain about anyone and anything. And sometimes our grumbling can become very malicious, and very inconsiderate. But as objects of grace, as people who have been shown grace in light of our offenses toward God, who through Jesus has shown grace to us, we can afford we have the ability, we have the privilege of being able to show grace to others, even if 
that person is treating us poorly. It's interesting here, though, it says to not grumble against each other or you will be judged. So, no. reality is, we're all going to be judged. Jesus is the judge. And if we're not found in Christ, um, there will be an ultimate judgment. But this isn't a judgment of finality or, or condemnation that he's talking there. He's, he's talking about we will be found guilty. We will be held accountable. Because the judge is at the door. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So we have these, these virtues of, of patience and perseverance and grace and this fourth virtue that James talks about here is integrity. Turn your eyes down to verse 12 where it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Yeah, and of course, this is an issue of pertaining to speech, which is somewhat related there to this idea of grace and because how we speak about others is an issue of speech as well, but We are to speak truth at all times. You know, this issue of our speech and our tongue has been brought up in James a number of times already in this book. You know, chapter 1, 13, chapter 1, verse 13 says that we shouldn't say when we are tempted by that it was God who did it. So we should watch our tongue that way. We can't say that we are religious people if we can't keep a tight rein on our tongue. That's in 126. And a few weeks ago, we looked at this in chapter 3, about this whole idea of the, the power of our tongue and that no person can really tame their tongue. But here, he's talking about this issue of the tongue and that we should have integrity in how we speak. James is echoing the words of Jesus again, as he does a number of times throughout this book. But he's taking words of Jesus here from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus forbids swearing oaths altogether. In the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 34 and 37 Jesus says, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. See, we shouldn't need to swear oaths when we are speaking to one another. We should be the type of people that others know that what we say, we mean. There is no need to go about and say, well, you know, I swear in my mother's grave that this is true. Or I swear on a stack of Bibles. Or I cross my heart, hope to die. We should be the type of people that when we make an affirmation or a denial of any kind, people know that it is unquestionably true. We should be people of integrity. And somehow our, our culture seems to be built on some framework of lies. We don't know who to trust anymore. You know, we can't trust the media, you know, we, Seems like the only people that anybody seems to be trusting are influencers on TikTok. And of course, you know, we all know how reliable that is. But, but lack of integrity invites oppression. When people can't trust us, they're going to take advantage of us. 
Yet, our integrity when we speak, even in the midst of oppression, focuses our heart on what is true, because we are speaking what is true. So there's these, these four virtues, patience, perseverance, grace, and integrity. So what is the outcome of having lived out these virtues in the midst of life's trials, in the, in the midst of life's difficulties? Well, I want to suggest three things. The first one is that living out these virtues enable us to see beyond our temporary circumstances and focus on what is a greater reality. And if you don't get anything else out of, out of what I'm saying today, I want you to get these next couple points right here. But when we are in the midst of an overwhelming trial, it's hard to see anything beyond that temporary situation. You know, when our son died, the only thing that I could think about for months was the grief of that. When we're being picked on at work or our boss is being a real pain in the tush, it seems, the only thing we can focus on is why is this person treating me like this? When we've been hurt, all we think about is that hurt or oppression. When we're been treated unfairly, all we can think about is getting justice. We live in the now. But these virtues help us recognize that these circumstances that we are facing are temporary and that there really is a greater reality for us to focus on. And James uses the illustration of a farmer in this, waiting patiently for the spring and fall rains. And after he's put in the hard work to till the ground and to plant the seed, he doesn't just focus his thoughts on the fact that the crop hasn't popped up the next day. He doesn't say, well, hey, look, I got this plot of land and it hasn't produced anything. I just I planted the seed yesterday. Why hasn't the fruit popped up yet? No, the farmer waits patiently on the rain that he knows will come. He's waiting for the harvest that will happen in the right season. Just pause for a moment just to make a short advertisement for our church garden. If you're, if you're, if you're not involved in, in being a part of our church garden, I want to invite you to it. My wife and some others do that Tuesday and Saturdays. It's a great way to get to know other people and and to help serve our church and our community. But, and you get to see this lived out on a pretty direct basis here. But, but a farmer waits patiently. He's not focused on the fact of what just happened. He knows that there's something else to come. And this is what we're getting at when at the beginning of our time, when we said that holding fast to God's goodness brings the future judgment to bear on the present. And there are three realities to focus on. There really is a third, even though the screen doesn't show it, but I'll get there in a second. But the first reality is this, that the Lord is coming soon. He mentions this three times in these few verses. In verse 7, that, be patient till the coming of the Lord. In verse 8, the coming of the Lord is near. And then verse 9, the judge is at the door. When we are in the midst of difficulties, we can remember this sure thing. That Jesus is coming back. And these trials that we are facing in this life are light and momentary. 
in light of his soon return, where he is going to come and make all things right. This is a theme that is referred to more than 300 times in the New Testament. But Jesus is coming soon. And we don't know when that will be. And that's all the reason why we need to be ready. Because it could happen at any time. The Lord is coming soon. But coming hand in hand in that, he's coming soon and that, that he will make all things right. But a part of it making right is that he's going to be coming as the judge. James says that we who are unjustly oppressed have this reason to be patient, that God will judge. You know, many of us have heard the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We like the idea of Jesus as our gracious Savior, or even as our Lord and King. And he is that, and and so much more. And there is another reality that is equally true, that he is the coming judge. His ascension into heaven, and him being seated at the right hand of God, anticipates his return to judge his enemies, to save his people, and to establish his kingdom. All the things that were inaugurated during his first coming will be consummated upon his second coming. The book of Revelation uh, vividly describes the Lord's coming as a time of judgment. Uh, Let me read Revelation 19, 11 through 16. It says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, Israel expected their Messiah to come as a strong military and political leader who would establish or reestablish the throne of David and to deliver Israel from the Roman oppressors. That he would come as a righteous judge, but he would take care of all that oppression and rule the nations with that iron rod. But then Jesus came, but not as a warrior as a servant, not to save from political oppression, but to save from sin. But at his second coming, however, Jesus will establish and execute true justice. You know, in this passage we just read, Jesus coming wearing a robe dipped in blood, not his own blood that he shed on the cross, but the blood of his defeated foes. It's from the winepress of God's divine wrath, talked about here and in Revelation 14, and sung in the battle hymn of the Republic, where he's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. It's the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And if somehow we're shocked by this, this very vivid and graphic description Uh, of this, it's probably because we don't understand the offense that sin has to God. But Jesus will come as the judge. 
and those not found belonging to him who reject and stand in opposition to him will get what they deserve. And so we can be patient in the midst of our trials because we know that there will come a time when our oppressors will face judgment and that it'll be God doing it. And it's not up to us. The Lord is coming. He's coming to judge. And the one last reality that you can focus on with that is that that there is the Lord's blessing that will come as a result of our patience. Yeah, we already talked about the farmer waiting for the rains and ultimately his, his, his patience uh, enables the crops to come and put food on his table and to sell and make money. But James uses the example of Job as well here. In verse 11 and for those of you who aren't familiar with Job's story, I encourage you to go back to the Old Testament and read uh, the book of Job. But he suffered unimaginable suffering and loss. He lost his wealth, his reputation, his children, his health. But through it all, the Bible says that Job did not sin and he did not blame God. And in the end... As Job remained loyal to God, what did God bring about? He restored all of Job's wealth. He doubled his initial wealth. He gave him 10 more children. He restored his reputation. And this isn't to say that that will happen in every case, where if we're oppressed or treated poorly, that somehow if we lose our wealth or health or some explained incidents, that God has promised to restore us in the same way that he has Job. But he can, and he might. But according to 1 Peter, we do have an inheritance, an imperishable, an undefiled, an unfading inheritance that is kept in heaven for us. And knowing that that kind of blessing awaits us makes it possible to see beyond our temporary circumstances and to have patience in the midst of trials. I'm going to wrap up uh, these last couple points uh, and just go over them real quickly just for the sake of time. But the last two outcomes of virtues are they empower us to be faithful to do what God has called us to do and that God is glorified in our words and our actions. Just like with the Old Testament prophets, who, they were God's spokesmen. Their job was to, to speak for God. And you would think that if they're doing what God called, called them to do, that their job would be pretty darn easy. Like, they're doing the right thing. God told them to do it, they're doing it. But most of the time, their message was met with opposition, and they faced unbelievable trials. You know, one that stands out to me was Jeremiah. You know, he's, he's known as the weeping prophet. During his ministry, he was put in stocks. He was thrown in prison. He was placed in a dungeon. All this by his own people. And throughout his entire ministry, he didn't give a single, he didn't have a single convert. And he'd continue to do what God called him to do. Think of Hosea, the horrific marriage he had and with a wife who kept cheating on him and prostituting herself. And there's so many, so many more. And it's unlikely that any of us will face the kind of things that the prophets faced. But we might. We might face persecution or ridicule for talking about Jesus. You might have a, a spouse cheat on you. You might have lies told about you and have your family ripped away from you. And if so, what will you do? Will you retaliate? 
Will you get mad and blame God? Will you shut yourself off from the rest of the world? Will you grumble and complain? Or will you be faithful to continue to do what God has called you to do? And lastly is that God is glorified. Gosh, there's so much I can say that, but when we live these out and we do the right thing, if we remain faithful, that that will be seen. The world will see that we respond differently and God will get glory from that. So in light of the fact that Jesus will come again, we can live patiently. We can persevere. We can show grace and we can have integrity. And it's those things, knowing those truths, that we can, we can say as we sung that it is well with our soul. So, Father, help us to live these out in light of your truth. Thank you that no matter what we face, we have this truth that you will come again and that ultimately... You do. You win in the end. You are coming for us. And we can persevere through all of life's difficulties because we know that our end is secure. And that it's not up to us to to deal with all the injustices of this world, but you will be the judge. And help us to live out in these truths and to live these virtues. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.